The address communicated by Mrs. Todd took me to a lodging house situated in a respectable street near the Gray's Inn Road. When I knocked the door was opened by Mrs. Clements herself. She did not appear to remember me, and asked what my business was. I recalled to her our meeting in Limeridge Churchyard at the close of my interview there with the woman in white, taking special care to remind her that I was the person who assisted in Catholic, as in had herself declared, to escape the pursuit from the asylum. This was my only claim to the confidence of Mrs. Clements. She remembered the circumstance the moment I spoke of it, and asked me into the parlor, in the greatest anxiety to know if I had brought her any news of Anne. It was impossible for me to tell her the whole truth without, at the same time, entering into particulars on the subject of the conspiracy, which it would have been dangerous to confide to a stranger. I could only abstain most carefully from raising any false hopes, and then explain that the object of my visit was to discover the persons who were really responsible for Anne's disappearance. I even added, so as to exonerate myself from any after reproach of my own conscience, that I entertained not the least hope of being able to trace her, that I believed we should never see her alive again, and that my main interest in the affair was to bring to punishment two men whom I suspected to be concerned in luring her away, and at whose hands I and some dear friends of mine had suffered a grievous wrong. With this explanation I left it to Mrs. Clements to say whether our interest in the matter, whatever difference there might be in the motives which actuated us, was not the same, and whether she felt any reluctance to forward my object by giving me such information on the subject of my inquiries as she happened to possess. The poor woman was at first too much confused and agitated to understand thoroughly what I said to her. She could only reply that I was welcome to anything she could tell me in return for the kindness I had shown to him, but as she was not very quick and ready, at the best of times, in talking to strangers, she would beg me to put her in the right way, and to say where I wished her to begin. Knowing by experience that the plainest narrative attainable from persons who are not accustomed to arrange their ideas, is the narrative which goes far enough back at the beginning to avoid all impediments of retrospection in its course, I asked Mrs. Clements to tell me first what had happened after she had left Limeridge, and so, by watchful questioning, carried her on from point to point, till we reached the period of Anne's disappearance. The substance of the information which I thus obtained was as follows. On leaving the farm at Todd's Corner, Mrs. Clements and Anne had traveled that day as far as Derby, and had remained there a week on Anne's account. They had then gone on to London, and had lived in the lodging occupied by Mrs. Clements at that time for a month or more, when circumstances connected with the house and the landlord had obliged them to change their quarters. Anne's terror of being discovered in London or its neighborhood, whenever they ventured to walk out, had gradually communicated itself to Mrs. Clements, and she had determined on removing to one of the most out-of-the-way places in England to the town of Grimsby in Lincolnshire, where her deceased husband had passed all his early life. His relatives were respectable people settled in the town, they had always treated Mrs. Clements with great kindness, and she thought it impossible to do better than go there and take the advice of her husband's friends. And would not hear of returning to her mother at Welmingham, because she had been removed to the asylum from that place, and because Sir Percival would be certain to go back there and find her again. There was serious weight in this objection, and Mrs. Clements felt that it was not to be easily removed. At Grimsby the first serious symptoms of illness had shown themselves in Anne. They appeared soon after the news of Lady Glyde's marriage had been made public in the newspapers, and had reached her through that medium. The medical man who was sent for to attend the sick woman discovered at once that she was suffering from a serious affection of the heart. The illness lasted long, left her very weak, and returned at intervals, though with mitigated severity, again and again. They remained at Grimsby, in consequence, during the first half of the new year, and there they might probably have stayed much longer, but for the sudden resolution which and took at this time to venture back to Hampshire, for the purpose of obtaining a private interview with Lady Glyde. Mrs. Clements did all in her power to oppose the execution of this hazardous and unaccountable project. No explanation of her motives was offered by Anne, except that she believed the day of her death was not far off and that she had something on her mind which must be communicated to Lady Glyde, at any risk, in secret.
Her resolution to accomplish this purpose was so firmly settled that she declared her intention of going to Hampshire by herself if Mrs. Clements felt any unwillingness to go with her. The doctor, on being consulted, was of opinion that serious opposition to her wishes would, in all probability, produce another and perhaps a fatal fit of illness, and Mrs. Clements, under this advice, yielded to necessity, and once more, with sad forebodings of trouble and danger to come, allowed in Catherick to have her own way. On the journey from London to Hampshire Mrs. Clements discovered that one of their fellow passengers was well acquainted with the neighborhood of Blackwater and could give her all the information she needed on the subject of localities. In this way she found out that the only place they could go to, which was not dangerously near to Sir Percival's residence, was a large village called Sandon. The distance here from Blackwater Park was between three and four miles, and that distance, and back again, and had walked on each occasion when she had appeared in the neighborhood of the lake. For the few days during which they were at Sandon without being discovered they had lived a little away from the village, in the cottage of a decent widow woman who had a bedroom to let, and whose discreet silence Mrs. Clements had done her best to secure, for the first week at least. She had also tried hard to induce and to be content with writing to Lady Glyde, in the first instance, but the failure of the warning contained in the anonymous letter sent to Limreach had made and resolute to speak this time, and obstinate in the determination to go on her errand alone. Mrs. Clements, nevertheless, followed her privately on each occasion when she went to the lake, without, however, venturing near enough to the boathouse to be witness of what took place there. When and returned for the last time from the dangerous neighborhood, the fatigue of walking, day after day, distances which were far too great for her strength, added to the exhausting effect of the agitation from which she had suffered, produced the result which Mrs. Clements had dreaded all along. The old pain over the heart and the other symptoms of the illness at Grimsby returned, and Anne was confined to her bed in the cottage. In this emergency the first necessity, as Mrs. Clements knew by experience, was to endeavor to quiet Anne's anxiety of mind, and for this purpose the good woman went herself the next day to the lake, to try if she could find Lady Glyde, who would be sure, as Anne said, to take her daily walk to the boathouse, and prevail on her to come back privately to the cottage near Sandon. On reaching the outskirts of the plantation Mrs. Clements encountered, not Lady Glyde, but a tall, stout, elderly gentleman, with a book in his hand, in other words, Count Fosco. The Count, after looking at her very attentively for a moment, asked if she expected to see anyone in that place, and added, before she could reply, that he was waiting there with a message from Lady Glyde, but that he was not quite certain whether the person then before him answered the description of the person with whom he was desired to communicate. Upon this Mrs. Clements at once confided her errand to him, and entreated that he would help to allay Anne's anxiety by trusting his message to her. The Count most readily and kindly complied with her request. The message, he said, was a very important one. Lady Glyde entreated Anne and her good friend to return immediately to London, as she felt certain that Sir Percival would discover them if they remained any longer in the neighborhood of Blackwater. She was herself going to London in a short time, and if Mrs. Clements and Anne would go there first, and would let her know what their address was, they should hear from her and see her in a fortnight or less. The Count added that he had already attempted to give a friendly warning to and herself but that she had been too much startled by seeing that he was a stranger to let him approach and speak to her. To this Mrs. Clements replied, in the greatest alarm and distress, that she asked nothing better than to take him safely to London, but that there was no present hope of removing her from the dangerous neighborhood, as she lay ill in her bed at that moment. The Count inquired if Mrs. Clements had sent for medical advice, and hearing that she had hitherto hesitated to do so, from the fear of making their position publicly known in the village, informed her that he was himself a medical man, and that he would go back with her if she pleased, and see what could be done for Anne. Mrs. Clements, feeling a natural confidence in the Count, as a person trusted with a secret message from Lady Glyde, gratefully accepted the offer, and they went back together to the cottage. And was asleep when they got there. The Count started at the sight of her, evidently from astonishment at her resemblance to Lady Glyde. Poor Mrs. Clements supposed that he was only shocked to see how ill she was.
He would not allow her to be awakened, he was contented with putting questions to Mrs. Clements about her symptoms, with looking at her, and with lightly touching her pulse. Sandon was a large enough place to have a grocer's and druggist's shop in it, and thither the Count went to write his prescription and to get the medicine made up. He brought it back himself, and told Mrs. Clements that the medicine was a powerful stimulant, and that it would certainly give him strength to get up and bear the fatigue of a journey to London of only a few hours. The remedy was to be administered at stated times on that day and on the day after. On the third day she would be well enough to travel, and he arranged to meet Mrs. Clements at the Blackwater station, and to see them off by the midday train. If they did not appear he would assume that and was worse, and would proceed at once to the cottage. As events turned out, no such emergency as this occurred. This medicine had an extraordinary effect on Anne, and the good results of it were helped by the assurance Mrs. Clements could now give her that she would soon see Lady Glyde in London. At the appointed day and time, when they had not been quite so long as a week in Hampshire altogether, they arrived at the station. The Count was waiting there for them, and was talking to an elderly lady, who appeared to be going to travel by the train to London also. He most kindly assisted them, and put them into the carriage himself, begging Mrs. Clements not to forget to send her address to Lady Glyde. The elderly lady did not travel in the same compartment, and they did not notice what became of her on reaching the London terminus. Mrs. Clements secured respectable lodgings in a quiet neighborhood, and then wrote, as she had engaged to do, to inform Lady Glyde of the address. A little more than a fortnight passed, and no answer came. At the end of that time a lady, the same elderly lady whom they had seen at the station, called in a cab, and said that she came from Lady Glyde, who was then at an hotel in London, and who wished to see Mrs. Clements, for the purpose of arranging a future interview with Anne. Mrs. Clements expressed her willingness, and being present at the time, and entreating her to do so, to forward the object in view, especially as she was not required to be away from the house for more than half an hour at the most. She and the elderly lady, clearly Madame Fosco, then left in the cab. The lady stopped the cab, after it had driven some distance, at a shop before they got to the hotel, and begged Mrs. Clements to wait for her for a few minutes while she made a purchase that had been forgotten. She never appeared again. After waiting some time Mrs. Clements became alarmed, and ordered the cabman to drive back to her lodgings. When she got there, after an absence of rather more than half an hour, and was gone. The only information to be obtained from the people of the house was derived from the servant who waited on the lodgers. She had opened the door to a boy from the street, who had left a letter for the young woman who lived on the second floor, the part of the house which Mrs. Clements occupied. The servant had delivered the letter, had then gone downstairs, and five minutes afterwards had observed and opened the front door and go out, dressed in her bonnet and shawl. She had probably taken the letter with her, for it was not to be found, and it was therefore impossible to tell what inducement had been offered to make her leave the house. It must have been a strong one, for she would never stir out alone in London of her own accord. If Mrs. Clements had not known this by experience nothing would have induced her to go away in the cab, even for so short a time as half an hour only. As soon as she could collect her thoughts, the first idea that naturally occurred to Mrs. Clements was to go and make inquiries at the asylum, to which she dreaded that and had been taken back. She went there the next day, having been informed of the locality in which the house was situated by and herself. The answer she received, her application having in all probability been made a day or two before the false and Catholic had really been consigned to safekeeping in the asylum, was, that no such person had been brought back there. She had then written to Mrs. Catherick at Wilmingham to know if she had seen or heard anything of her daughter, and had received an answer in the negative. After that reply had reached her, she was at the end of her resources, and perfectly ignorant where else to inquire or what else to do. From that time to this she had remained in total ignorance of the cause of Anne's disappearance and of the end of Anne's story.